In this episode, we look back at the 100th anniversary of airmail travel here in Belfont, hike the James Cleveland Trail, and learn about the American Philatelic Center. Join us as we explore more of our hidden happy valley. Welcome to the American Philatelic Center here in Belfont, Pennsylvania. This place will surprise you. It has amazing resources and exhibits on local, national, and world history. Thank you, Kim, for having us at the American Philatelic Center. Can you tell us um, about this place? Sure. Um, it's often called the Match Factory uh, because historically it was a match factory. They broke construction in 1899, opened as a match factory in 1900, and as a match factory until 1947. It was a relatively large match factory producing matches um, in the early 1900s. I think it was one of the top 10 largest in the U.S. Um, Belfont ended up with it and then we actually purchased it in 2002. Um, when we purchased it, there was one roof that held water. We spent about $16 million uh, renovating the space. Currently we use about a little bit over 50% of the space. It's about 100,000 square feet total. We have about a dozen other tenants. Probably the best known one would be Big Spring Spirits. So this is an old photo of what is now the Big Spring Spirits patio, which is a wonderful space now that I enjoy frequently. This was a post office basically from 1860s to 1914, and there was a general store at about the 1930s. Oh, so it was both post office and general, post office and general yeah, yeah. store, which was common. So what types of exhibits do you have here? Well, most of the stuff we have is philatelic related to the purpose of our organization, but not everything. I mean, we're in the Headsville Post Office and General Store right now. We just recently introduced an exhibit on the Holocaust. We have um, lots of memorabilia related to early airmail. Belfont was the first stop on the New York to Chicago route. Unfortunately, the, the early airmail service, the planes were pretty primitive. Um, initially, open air cockpit, no instruments, not even an altimeter to tell you how high you were. Hi, I'm Scott Tiffany, Librarian and Director of Information Services here at the American Philatelic Research Library in Belfont, Pennsylvania. Uh, as I say, we serve the general public, so people can contact us at any time if they have questions about their collections, in this case about airmail. They can contact us and we can give them answers to those questions. Most of our questions come to us remotely, so people either email us, write us, call us, send us letters uh, to sort of have questions answered and uh, we answer them as best we can. Daniel Hines was a local aviation historian, if you will. He and his brother sort of collected a lot of materials. So yeah. like they did interviews with the pilots. They did a lot of photographs, obviously. This is uh, Alice Hines here. Alice Hines. Yeah. An extensive photo collection that, yeah. that was donated to us. So this is, uh, this is uh, an aircraft. Uh, there's ones on the different pilots, the different airfields, and these are all just really extensive. We got both the negatives and the originals. So uh, these were on planes? These were on planes. You can see the cancel here. That's super cool. So these were on biplanes yeah. and flew into Belfont and marked that yeah. they were in Belfont. Marked, they were in Belfont. So uh, just trying to... With June 6, he lands in an emergency field. Yeah. June 10, he lands in an emergency field. It just seems so casual though. Yeah, right. Yeah. Probably the coolest thing we have is this uh, pilot's log book. Oh, wow. So this is Charles Ames' book. Wow. He's a pilot. And he documents every flight he took, uh, where he landed. It's really cool. You can go through the book. And so sort of some of the usual stuff arrived in Cleveland, such and such. And every once in a while, you'll see a problem uh, landed in, in field. Farmers, just, just random stuff yeah. like that. Sounds like, you know, half a day. Okay, so. yeah. uh, a really neat item that we have in the collection, this is an actual sort of map that one of the pilots used. So here we have Belfont, Pennsylvania, and down at the other end we have Belmont, New York, which is where the horse racing track is now. That's where the airfield used to be. And the pilot, you can see, would put markers along the way. He would be sort of pointing out things that he saw. Uh, outside the plane because we're, we're talking about uh, piloting at this time that was seat of the pants basically and they said they used to sort of wrap this around their thigh when they're in the cockpit and they would just pull out the section they needed to look at and then look over the side of the plane to see where they were so that's how they sort of navigated um, here across uh, from Pel from Belfont to to uh, Belmont New York Wow 
there is no better place to learn about airmail history than right here at the American Philatelic Center. And we should take a hike and experience it. Come on. We're here at the James Cleveland Trail, which was blazed in 1972 by the local Boy Scouts, and it's still maintained by them. Yeah, we're gonna hike up Mount Nittany to the crash site where there's a memorial to Jimmy Cleveland. Look at that babbling brook. So whenever there's double blazes, uh, blaze markers on the tree, that means there's a turn. So be sure to make that turn instead of heading off into no man's land. Because it is pretty difficult. It, it, start, it goes from very moderate to very difficult as we get on the side of the mountain here. So some of the weather reports for Jimmy Cleveland's crash the weather conditions were more foggy and misty. There was varying accounts, but it's very easy to imagine fog on Mount Nittany. We made it. There's the memorial right up there. It was the first fatal crash near Belfont since the 1925 Ames wreck. So this crash was eerily similar to a crash six years earlier. Charles Ames crashed just four miles west where we're standing right now. Charles Ames was a World War I pilot, very experienced, and he had left New Jersey that night in 1925 on a night flight, and he was expected in Belfont by midnight, and he never showed up. So the search for Charles Ames made national news. The National Guard was even called in to help search, and after nine days, Ames was finally found, still strapped in his cockpit by a search party from Hecla Gap. So the Jimmy Cleveland Memorial here was brought up the mountain in 1972 using a bulldozer when they blazed the original trail and all the materials they needed to put it in place. It was designed by Mays Memorial in Lamont and was modeled after the Washington Monument. This is a cairn, a rock built memorial filled with Jimmy Cleveland's plane parts from the crash. So on May 24th, 1931, Jimmy Cleveland was flying from New York to Cleveland when he crashed here on Mount Nittany. So he almost made it over the summit of Mount Nittany. The weather was bad. Some reports said foggy, some said misty, icy, some said snowy. So whatever it was, he didn't clear the summit and he literally crashed and burned in this area. These are some of the plane parts from that wreckage. There was an immediate search because at the Belfont Airport, they saw the explosion. One other fly in that was built from parts, but as soon as this came out in 31, it went to Eastern Air Transport and it flew contract airmail route number 19. Landing lights underneath each wing tip. They're mechanically extendable, retractable series of pulleys and cables, magnesium flare tubes. So this airplane would leave New York, fly to Philly, DC, Richmond, Greensboro, North Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina and then Atlanta, Georgia. And there'd be an airplane going north at the same time. And it did that until 1938. It was basically obsolete shortly after it was built because the airlines started flying passengers and mail in the, the new Boeings and the uh, 317 and the uh, DC-1, DC-2, then subsequently the DC-3 airplanes. This airplane was dismantled and sat for a lot of years. <clears throat> and it was purchased from a barn up in Spokane, Washington. A fellow named Jack Rose restored the airplane, and in 1977, it won reserve grand champion at Oshkosh. Steve McQueen bought it. He went up and he saw the airplane. He had had quite a few airplanes through the years, and uh, he fell in love with this. He took it out to Santa Paula, California, and he operated out of Santa Paula until he died. And then it went through two other owners, and the, the founder of 84 Lumber, a fellow named Joe Hardy, bought it on auction back in uh, 2001. And uh, I was asked to help bring it back to the museum that he has. He's got a small 
what he calls the, the Woodlands Toy Store. He keeps this and two real rare De Havilland airplanes also, a moth miner and a hornet moth. And I'm the guy that's lucky enough to maintain them and operate them. <laughs> so it's, it's a pleasure to come on over here and, and meet with some like-minded people. And the airmail is real near and dear to our hearts also. I know this is kind of the headquarters right here, the East Coast airmail operations. So, so I just, I wanted to make sure we got it over here for you. And, and you got to be a part of the event today. So thank you very much. We visited the Center County Library and Historical Museum. Not only is it great for researching local history and genealogy, but it has a historical museum upstairs. We are going to learn more about airmail by visiting our friends at the American Philatelic Center. Uh, we're a worldwide collection, so we collect anything that has to do with stamps, postal history, philately. You can get into a whole area of like V-mail during the Second World War, there was V-mail that went to the troops where people would sort of uh, write a letter. It would then get uh, copied, like mimeographed, just sort of put on a microfilm and sent over. When I got started with this job here in the library, I thought it was just about stamps and stamp collecting, and that's just such a small part. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so much history, like you go through all the eras of horse, you know, messengers and couriers to railroads, to air, air mail. When, when a country starts, so some of, the, some of the things that we have here are about the stamps and the postal history of countries that no longer exist, like dead countries. And so, but every country that sort of starts up or a new country that sort of comes into existence, two things they have when they start. Currency is always usually number one, second are stamps. Now you're thinking this is pre-email days, so that's the way you communicate. If I wanted to get some, a bit of information to someone across the other part of the country, I didn't, didn't have email, didn't have phone necessarily at that time, at certain times. So yeah, those are the two things that come into existence when a new country comes into being. Why is this in Belfont, Pennsylvania? I would always say that, well, because uh, this was a very important uh, stop on the early airmail route here in the U.S. Scott's right. Airmail has its roots in Belfont, and Matt's going to tell you all about it. Hi, we're in front of Belfont High School. It's a very historic site here. It is the former location of the only scheduled airmail stop between New York out east and Chicago out west and they needed to refuel somewhere, and this is right in the middle of that path, right in central Pennsylvania, right in Belfont, right in Center County. Airmail pilots would take primitive planes, spy planes, open cockpits with hundreds of pounds of mail, and it was a very risky, dangerous job. The site for the field was chosen by pioneer aviator Max Miller and was in regular use for airmail until 1925. So early aviation like this is very dangerous. And even the pilot who chose this site, Max Miller, was unfortunately in a fiery crash in 1920, just about a year and a half after choosing this site. There's a beautiful memorial to the airmail pioneers behind the American Philatelic Society. It honors the 34 young pilots who lost their lives in this dangerous stretch called Hell Stretch between New Jersey and Ohio. All the ridge and valleys in this area of Pennsylvania and all the Allegheny Mountains uh, are not only unpredictable in terms of their heights, but they're unpredictable in terms of the weather. And many of these pilots crashed more than once. Many walked away from other crashes and bad weather or other conditions. So it was a very, very dangerous thing, and that's what made them so fascinating as well and so courageous by taking those risks to do what they love, to fly, and to help the nation with its airmail transportation. These pioneer aviators were seen as celebrities. They're risking their lives to do an important service and they love to fly and the people love them for that. They would also do daring and dashing things. Local papers reported the airmail pilots would buzz the town, fly up high street and fly right by that weather vane and try to spin that fish on the top of the Center County Courthouse. 
So the airmail pilots were loved by the communities that they flew to, especially in Belfont. Sometimes they'd let kids out of school to go see them land at the airfield. They'd have them over for dinner, they'd do their laundry. Uh, they were friends with them in some cases. Sometimes they dated the airmail pilots. And again, they were just seen as, as local heroes, as national heroes, uh, and had this celebrity status because of the risk they took to do something that was unheard of. Many people had never even seen an airplane or these air machines, and they were just pioneers.